Hello everyone, my name is Lisa Grace and I am joined today by John Smedley and he is the founder of Teach Active and we will be chatting today about how we can keep our students active, out of their seats, more healthy while they learn and we are going to be exploring some of the strategies that you can use in your English classrooms, in your math classrooms, and potentially other classrooms while you are teaching to get your students to be up and moving and active. Welcome, John. Thank you, Lisa. Great to be here uh, with you. And thanks for inviting me onto the podcast. You're most welcome. Please introduce yourself to our audience, John. Okay, so yeah, my name is John Smedley. I am uh, a teacher at heart, I suppose. I've I taught for 18 years before coming out of the classroom. I was an advisor for PE, for a local authority, so hence my love of getting children up and active uh, and introducing movement into the school day. And then I went back into school, I was a deputy head, and I left six years ago, uh, and now I have the, uh, the real honour, I suppose, of working with schools all over the UK and internationally as well. That's brilliant. So a former teacher talking to a former teacher. So this conversation should be good. Now, <laughs> we know that we all should be passionate about movement. And you gave us a little hint just now as to why you're passionate, because you were a former teacher and a former PE teacher. But what's driving you to create um, a more active learning environment all over the world? I suppose, I mean, it certainly does stand from when I was teaching and trying to engage children in, in, in particular lessons, in particular with English and maths, and uh, perhaps where self-esteem was down or where children felt I wasn't good at this subject, really trying to build up confidence. And, and I felt that the, and, and found that a great way to do that was by introducing active learning and getting the children up uh, out of seats and saying, well, okay, let's take learning down to the hall or let's take learning outside or perhaps sometimes just in the classroom but introducing some movements and, and just the difference that it's that, that that's made and the passion and I suppose the love of learning that it instills with children that I've seen um, I just want more and more children to, to benefit from that. Yeah how much are we sitting in classes I'm, I'm sure you must have done some research and looked into this how much are children sitting in their average school day average school day in we think that 70 percent of the school day is sedentary um, yeah so sat down and of course then um when we're going home as well where in past children might have then gone home and, and done a lot of exercise outside of school but of course we're finding now that home life is more sedentary as well so we're really fighting a, a bit of a battle there in terms of between the two so of course many children are very active um, but you know we know that four out of five children in the UK and in UAE aren't um, hitting the recommended amount of physical activity guidelines and um, and there's repercussions to that. Why are we sitting so much? What's the cause? I think within school, um, perhaps, you know, many things have changed in schools over the years, but maybe the one thing that hasn't is, is how we learn. And we, 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 do we ever ask ourselves that question of, you know, why, why are the children sat down at a desk and um, on a chair for their maths and English lessons? If I asked a teacher to, to picture an English or maths lesson, or even a student, they would probably draw the child sat down at a desk at a table. And what would perhaps, of course, there is a time and a place for that. And but maybe we're challenging the idea to think, um, you know, can we introduce some movement? Uh, you know, and, and are we sat down because it's good for behavior? Is it good because it's the way that we were taught? Is it because it's good for organization? Or is it because it's the way that children learn best? Because again, there's lots of research which would show you that actually children learn better by being active. But here's my thing, right? Because I'm going back to my classroom days and I'm thinking, okay, I'm in inner London. I've got 30 <laughs> students in my classroom. They're all 12 years old. And I'm going to make them get up and active in my language lesson. How am I going to possibly control them? How am I going to get them back on task? Or how am I going to keep them on task? What did you suggest? And what's actually really interesting about this is when, when I set out and started working with schools and, and I said to them, the children would really enjoy it and actually it's going to support academic attainment and it's going to get the children active. 
what schools started to come back to me with is to say, actually, not only that, but it really helps with things like behavior. It really helps. So those children who might be disengaged, mm. those who might be problematic because they don't like maths or English or the languages. And, and actually, this will really help them because it's, it's engaging them. And it might be a, it might be a, a challenge the first time you do it, Lisa, I'll be honest, because a, a student might think, oh, you know, get a bit excited thinking it's this is a bit novel. But actually, if we can instill it and, and make it part of the, the weekly timetable, then soon it can it can help things like behavior and also attendance and social skills and teamwork and uh, many other different you know, skills which you want to develop with your students as well. I want to go back to what we started with, and that is the amount of time children are sitting. What are some of the, the, the bad side effects of that much sitting, especially on students' health? Yeah, again, this is really interesting because I often say to you know, teachers and students about the why is physical activity important? And, and there's kind of two, thing, two sides we can look at. There is the negative side, of course. So we know that of course, you know children spend now five primary age children five plus hours in front of a screen or an iPad you know every single day you know that's a huge amount of time the fact that children are obese and overweight and, and the and the court the problems that causes in adulthood because we know that the vast majority of children if you're inactive as a child um, the majority of the time you're inactive as an adult as well and, and that can cause a, a lot of health problems. Um, but actually, I prefer to look at all the positives. So when I say to children, why is physical activity important? They tell me that it's about staying slim, fit and healthy. And I say, well, that's true. But how about it also helps you with your memory? It helps you to, with your learning, helps you to retain information, helps you with confidence, resilience, self-esteem. You might sleep better. You might have more energy. And I think through the last 18 months and what we've had with COVID is, you know, as adults ourselves, we've really thought, gosh, it's important for me to go out and do a bit of exercise, not just because of slim fit and healthy, but because it's good for our mental and emotional well-being as well. Um, and that's certainly what we're finding with, with children in schools, that active children do better. Yeah. I wonder, though, do you have a recommendation of how active a child should be throughout their school day? Well, what we recommend here is that children should, the recommended amount is, is 60 minutes, and on, on, on average, 60 minutes of physical activity a day. And we suggest that 30 minutes within the school day and then 30 minutes at home. Uh, I'll be honest with you, Lisa, there are some schools, um, in particular in, in certain areas, where they will say that the children really struggle to, to be active outside of school. And that might be because of uh, they live in a place which, um, perhaps it's not safe to play out, uh, you know, um, uh, and maybe inner city London would be some of those and, and where parents want to keep them in and don't let them want to just roam around. So actually some of the schools have said, you know, we're going to do the full 60 minutes within school. And that's when we start to see all of those, you know, those wider benefits that we're talking about today. Yeah, I wonder as well. I wonder a lot of things, <laughs> but I, I, I wonder, you know, if this should fall only on PE teachers or should all teachers be really getting involved in keeping students active during their learning? Yeah, oh, I'm so pleased you asked me that because uh, I mean, I was a primary school teacher, so I had my class and I taught every single subject. And yeah, this this isn't when I'm talking about active learning. I, I say to teachers, I'm not talking about PE, you know, leave the PE, you know, you've got your PE lessons. This is just about bringing movement into English and maths lessons or in, in, in your languages, your history, your geography, and just challenging the way that, you know, our pedagogy and, and challenging the way that we deliver. So, yeah, it's certainly a responsibility for every single teacher and, and something that I hope that a lot of teachers would share my passion, and I'm sure they do share my passion about. What, what do teachers say? Because I'm just kind of thinking about myself back in the day when I taught and I'm thinking if someone said I should be having my Spanish or my English or my literature classes up and moving and I probably roll my eyes a little bit. I'm like, listen, this isn't this is not my piece. Like, and so they need to go to PE in the sports hall, run around and come back. And when they get to me, it's time for serious work. How do you convince teacher that having the students moving is serious work? Like they are learning and it is beneficial. Uh, I would. Uh, well, uh, we do a lot of teacher training and a lot of workshops. 
Um, so the, when we do those, I play the games of the teachers and I would demonstrate and say, OK, we want to teach a, a maths objective. I'm going to play it with you again. And then I would ask them, you know, did you enjoy that? You know, would your children enjoy that? How could that uh, fit in with the, what you're doing at the moment? So I'm, I'm certainly not saying to teachers, I think you should use, do this all of the time and get rid of you all your brilliant work. You know, teachers are fantastic, aren't they? What I say is that this is another, another string to your bow in terms of something else that you can do. And one of our schools here, you know, they say one of my maths lessons each week will be through active maths. Um, but then as an intervention programme, they use it three times a week. And, and in terms of how we get schools on board, so I show them, um, but I share them with case studies. So I say, look, you know, in the UK alone, we're in a, over a thousand schools. This is the case studies. This is what other teachers are, are saying. This is what people on the shop floor are saying. And this is what you know, the Department for Education published one of our case studies about active learning. This is what the research we were working in partnership with Loughborough University. Um, this is what the UK primary school of the year who users say. This is a school that have gone from national averages to the top 2% of maths results nationwide or are having great results with their reading and their writing as a result of introducing this. And we know that teachers listen to teachers. You know, you did and I did. That's where we go to for advice. Um, and when I start to show them that, I just say to them, I just want you to have a go. And I give them some plans and I say, have a go. And then and then come back to me and see if, you know, and have I convinced you? And I'm sure some people, Lisa, will roll their eyes and think, oh, no, I don't know this. But uh, equally, uh, I'm sure slowly but surely we're, we're getting more and more teachers doing this approach. Yeah. OK, so we don't have your programme and and doesn't matter because active learning is active learning. So we're going to go course. into some methods, right? So we're teaching maths and we're teaching it to year three and we we want to get them up and active and learning can you give me two of your best active learning activities that teachers can try right right now or tomorrow in their maths lesson in year three and if you don't want to do year three feel free to do another year group okay um, i've got three and a half thousand ideas so to choose two will always be challenging so um, if it was something, for example, like let me give you something which is really easy, which I did at a conference recently when I was getting um, talking to how we teach times tables and, and about how we do this and how we want to make it a little bit more exciting. And we simply got a balloon and we played balloon times tables and so or tennis tables, as we called it. And we had a balloon between the two of us and we just hit the ball to each other and chanted our times tables as we went. So it might be obviously two, four, six, eight. Now, all of your listeners could do that, that, that tomorrow and see, you know, that's another. Of course, that, that alone isn't going to uh, change the world. But that alongside the other great tactics and, and strategies that your teachers are doing um, can really support that. Um, other things like, you know, I, I always play a game called number chase. So I, I set out different clues and the children will go to one clue. And so it might be with solving problems and they will solve a problem. And the answer to that one will tell them to go to another card. And then the answer to that one will tell them to go to another card and then to another card and to another card. And I get these children doing 20 word problems and they've done exactly what I wanted them to do. They've done multi-step problems but they've been active and they've enjoyed it. And sometimes they say, oh, I didn't, you know, I, 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 you know, I, I forgot I, I was even doing maths, um, which I say, well, actually, you know, I want to make sure you still do maths. But also it's a great opportunity for them in pairs then to do some maths chat and, and some number talk and some great opportunities for problem solving, for fluency, for reasoning. Um, you know, I've got you know, running and collecting. You know, I, I say to teachers, rather than giving them a, a, a problem to solve, Let's do, let's give them some problems that have already been solved and let's get the children to run and collect them and then say whether they're true or false and look at them in, in detail and have they been done correctly or, or incorrectly. You know, let's give them fractions and tell the children to, to get in order. Um, let's have times, analog and digital clocks and, and let's go and, and, and match with our partner as well. So there are so many. I know you told me to tell you too. Yeah, um, go on. I'm loving them. This there's is, so this many. You, um, you. I, you, 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 you touched on something that I, I think is quite good. The fact that you just need something simple, like a balloon, because sometimes yes. we kind of get lost in the whole mix of trying to find, you know, what equipment do I need and how do I put this all together? 
but simple things like balloons and just little cards with clues that can go places and you can have the students run around. I see how it lends itself perfectly to maths for English. How do we do it for English lessons? Give me some ideas how what you could do in English language lessons to get them. OK, it was interesting because it, it just started with maths and our teachers loved it so much. They said, John, we want some English ideas. So we started off with lots of grammar ideas. So about how we could teach spellings, uh, how we could teach sentence level and text level and punctuation. So when teaching children about paragraphs, they run and they collect part of a, uh, they get part of a text and they come back together. And then the next person will go and collect part and the next person. And then when the children have got all the paragraphs, they need to decide, well, we've got these paragraphs, but which order are they going to go in? Um, we might have games where they're going and, and running and collecting parts of a sentence and then putting those that, that sentence in, in order. We might have them going on a treasure hunt punctuation and visiting different stations and then trying to read the uh, little piece of text there and, and, and as you working as detectives, work out where which pieces of grammar have been missing from this. Mm -hmm. And then fostering a love of reading, where we ask children questions, we get, we, we get them to read some, for example, a piece of poetry, and then there might be clues um, stuck around the hall that they need to go and uh, visit, and then using their knowledge of what they've just read, try and um, answer those questions. Or we do many drama things like, of course, pretending to be that character, acting out what's going to happen next within the story. So, again, lots of different ideas for reading and writing as well. Yeah, I like that. So when you, OK, so you have you have the, the students do these things. Are there levels to the activity? So, for example, you start off simple and then they become more complex. Is, is, is that is that also something that can be done where it starts simple? in year, say for example, year one, and the same activity just gets more complex as they go through the year group um, up and up. Yeah, well, 100%. So um, if I was to look at one of the games that, that we've got, it, it, that same game would be in year one, year two, year three, year four, year five, year six, as, as you mentioned. Um, so and, and the resources would just be different that we would need. So that game is still applicable. Um, and if 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 the if they're using our program, it's done for you. If you come up with your own ideas, of course you would just um, pitch it at the right level for the children um, and the the level that they're working at. Yeah. All right. So I, I got lots of ideas there, and I'm loving them. Like I'm totally loving them. Okay. But our schools are back. But you know we have a little bit of protocol around COVID, and you can't have the kids too close. Do you have any like COVID proof activities you can share with us that keeps them active, but not too close together? Yeah, well, interestingly enough, because, uh, you know, we had to uh, consider this over the uh, over the last 18 months. And we, we went through all of our three and a half thousand plans and we identified 1,800, which were COVID safe. That we give said. me some, give me some. Well, I've just got to say that a lot of them, and I'd say all of our games, it's what, one thing that's really interesting is, is they don't need, and, and probably all of those things I've spoke to you about there, they don't need equipment. So we're not talking about, because when people think about physical activity, they think, is, does he want us to get balls out and bean bags out and hoops out? And of course, there's none of that at all. So it, it's just in terms of the resources which we, we might want to, to use. And I think also what teachers are great at is um, again, because this isn't any of the games I talk about, you don't have to say I'm going to do it in that particular way. I think what people like about the flexibility of the, the ideas that I give them is they, they take it, Lisa, and like any great teacher, they say, I'm going to put my own stamp on that and I'm going to do it in my particular way. And I know my children better than you, John. I know my school environment. I know what space I've got and I can do this but I'm going to change it and make it better. So, I mean, all of those games that I've just spoke to you there, I think all of those could be still done in the environment that we've got and in the times that we've got. We might just have to think, well, uh, you know, and again, in England at the moment, some schools are still in bubbles, some aren't. Um, so they might be using this in, in slightly different ways as well at the moment. Yeah, we, we have a situation here in the Middle East where schools are back, even, even CCAs are back, 
but within within that you still have to have the precautions and you can't you know be too too close you're still wearing masks in schools which i really appreciate so i i get what you're saying a lot of the activities that you mentioned they can be done safely and and people don't need lots of equipment they don't need to be like huddled together you know no, what I, yeah you know what i want to find out though i can see teachers who are more so i wouldn't say mature but more experienced being able to have these active learning sessions built into their classrooms but what about your new teachers your your nqts they're not called nqts they're called early career teachers now right yeah, so they're your ects how do you help them to get the confidence to do some of these active learning because here's the thing right <laughs> sitting in front of you quietly it looks like success as an ect yeah and you know I, I think with with all of our schools that we work with it's a whole school approach mm -hmm. so individual teachers don't come and we work with whole schools and those thousand schools that we are working with within that school there is normally a a active learning leader now that might be your maths lead your english lead it might be your head teacher it might be your p lead but it's that one person who in your school is going to really drive this within your school and what we find is when i look at steps to success is that is really key and i suppose that's just like a someone being a maths lead or an english lead or a language lead is that they can um, they can drive this through the school they can keep it on the agenda they can keep, keep it on the radar they can maybe share good practice. They can get some of the more experienced teachers, perhaps showing some of the ECTs and supporting them. And just like you would in any other subject, you know, if you're really passionate about this, I do think that is key. So what you'd say is then maybe hopefully never left alone. Interestingly, what we do get is some of those younger uh, teachers. They're sometimes um, the ones who are more willing to take the risk and, and give it a go and say, actually, you know, I you know, some of the more mature teachers might have been teaching a certain way for a certain amount of time and actually might be a little bit more resistant to it to start with, where a younger person, uh, perhaps, or early career might think, actually, yeah, OK, I'll give that a go. And we are actually working with universities now as well and going in to deliver initial teacher training, again, about the benefits of active learning. So uh, getting there early with them is key as well. Yeah, I do agree. All right, so we're winding down the podcast, so we're going to take it away from um, active learning, etc., and just ask you some general questions as a former teacher. In terms of the classroom practice, what do you think is changing now, now than when you were in the classroom, let's say? What changes have you seen? Um, I think that... Even from when I was in the classroom, you know, five years ago, the five, six years ago, the, the, the pressure on teachers is, of course, I mean, it was demanding then, I think even more so now. And um, of course, COVID is, you know, it was such a difficult, difficult time to be a teacher. And you, now you're having to think, well, how can I deliver lessons face to face and also maybe delivering this online as well? So a little bit of a different ball game and, and um, I think it's a you know it's been a real learning curve for many many different teachers. Um, I think one thing that has become um, and, and this is for the better I think is that from COVID maybe one of the positives that has come out is that we're really now tuned into the uh, you know emotional and mental well-being of our students. Um, of course, all teachers care about that, but we're so drummed into perhaps sometimes thinking we have to do great maths and English results and we have to get age-related expectations and we have to get results and good data, which I was like as well, because that happens, doesn't it, as a school leader. But actually maybe COVID has made us sit us back and think, I think it's not all about stamping the result on the head and away they go. I really need to look after these, these young people in my care and, and think about um, you know, their happiness and their well-being as well. So uh, it's hard for teachers. It's, I'm sure it's stressful for teachers. I know, I know obviously lots of teachers, um, and I think, uh, but hopefully that's one of the good things that's come out of this. Yeah. And the question that I like to ask everyone, whether you're a teacher or not, 
is what is your hope for education globally going forward? I think for me, for education, it would just be that we develop children, we develop, you know, the, that next generation, I suppose, in the right way. And I know that might sound ridiculous, but there is so much emphasis on on academic grades. And, and for me, it's not about that. It, of course, that's important, but it, it's about developing the whole child. And you, 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 what's going to make you successful in, in life? Yes, it might be A grades and it might be all these fantastic results. But if you haven't got your mental health and your well-being and your happiness and your self-esteem and your confidence and your resilience, then you're not going to be successful in any walk of life. So I just hope that the curriculum, which I think we're trying to get to, some schools faster than others, I hope that the curriculum concentrates on developing the whole child rather than just being results driven. Yeah, that's a good hope. Um, <laughs> it is, it is. It's, it's a good hope because that's what's going to make people and the world better is when we focus on the whole person and not just the academic the whole child and not just the academic so that's a good hope teach active what can we yes. where can we find out more how can we learn more about what you're doing okay well the, we can visit the website um so teachactive.org and on there you can watch a video you can uh, you can have a little read of some case studies of, of the impact you can set up a trial you can even set up a one-to-one -one demo with me so I can share with you in a little bit more detail um, how the resource is supporting schools and, and just allow you to find out a little bit more and see if it's for you. Brilliant. Thank you so much, John, for joining me on the podcast. Thank you, Lisa. It's been a pleasure.